yet, but the machine could automatically calculate mathematical equations in a way that no device at that time could do. She was only a teenager, but Lovelace understood how the difference engine worked and knew it had the potential to be very important. Oh, actually, that was something else. Another of Babbage's ideas was for a device called the analytical engine. It was designed to add, subtract, multiply, and divide numbers, derive square roots, and make comparisons. The machine could do these things by reading instructions on punched cards. You're getting ahead of me, and please don't do that to my boards. Anyway, soon after Lovelace met with Babbage, she married a scientist named William King. King was a nobleman, so he went by a bunch of fancy titles, including Earl of Lovelace. That's how Ada became known as Ada King, the Right Honorable Countess of Lovelace. She had three children and quickly went back to her mathematical work. Then, in 1842, another mathematician wrote a detailed description of Charles Babbage's analytical engine in French. By that time, Babbage had grown quite impressed by Lovelace's intellect. He'd even given her an endearing nickname, the Enchantress of Numbers. So he asked her to translate and take notes on the French description of the analytical engine for him. Lovelace worked on this for nine months, adding many of her own unique insights and calculations. Her notes included a plan for how the engine could calculate a sequence of numbers called the Bernoulli numbers. Today, many historians consider this to have been the first computer program, and Lovelace the first programmer. Computer programs, by the way, are the all-important instructions that computers need to perform any function. Lovelace also predicted that computing machines might one day be used to do things like compose music and create graphics. Yeah, she sure was right about that, and we're living proof. Seriously, though, Lovelace was a visionary in many ways. She was only one of a few people in her day who got how these early computers worked, and she was possibly the only one who really appreciated how they might be used. It was pretty impressive, considering she lived at a time when women weren't accepted as scholars, much less mathematicians. In the end, Babbage was never able to fully build either of his early computers. And sadly, Ada's health went downhill not long after she published her work on the analytical engine. It's thought that she suffered from cancer for a number of years. Lovelace died in 1852, about two weeks before her 37th birthday. Hey, what did you do with my... board? Well, good luck with that. Awesome. Let's all go right now to Quizlet.live. We're moving right along. Let's review these terms, my dudes. There's your code, 840. Almost got it up. One second. Uh, Missing a handful of you. Got about 30 seconds to jump in there, please. All right. 
right? Here are your spirit animals, and they're racing. And they're racing. Brooke, right? Uh, so it's eight six uh, eight four zero six. Is that three nine? I'll bring it back to the join screen as soon as we're done with this one, okay? But just go to quizlet.live. You got it? One second here. Quizlet.live. All right, here we go. Last one. This one's for all the Tostitos, and they're racing. Nice. All right. Would everybody go to Schoology right now, please? All right. So in Schoology, you are going to see a little something like this. Let me share my screen. One sec. 
So here's what it kind of looks like for you. You're going to go right down to where it says upfront articles, and we've got one upfront article in there. Go ahead and open that bad boy up. Okay, and you can see it looks a little something like that. And I'm going to take this and I'm going to put this on my screen and make it just a little bit bigger so that I can read it for you. So here we go. Everybody have it open? Good. All right. Everybody online? Good. Here we go. A national outcry over, uh, over anti-Asian hate. Violence and rhetoric against Asian Americans has been on the rise. In the days since the, uh, he first heard about the mass shootings in Atlanta in which six Asian Americans, uh, excuse me, Asian American women died, 17-year-old Michael Fu has been thinking a lot about something that happened to him when he was about eight. He and his younger brother were in an Atlanta park when a group of boys started throwing rocks at them and yelling racial epithet uh, directed toward Asian people. Michael went to a nearby police officer who just happened to be Asian American and was sympathetic. He told me things like this will happen, recalls Michael, whose parents are both immigrants from China. As an Asian in this nation, you have to develop a thick skin. Incidents like that have become more common over the past year, fueled in part by false claims about the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic and racist language by some officials. Then came this week's fatal shootings in Atlanta, uh, in Atlanta area massage parlors of eight people, six of them women of Asian descent. Amid fear, sadness, and pain, the carnage has evoked another emotion among some Asian Americans, anger over the country's longstanding failure to take discrimination against them seriously. I do think that what we've seen in the past, this, uh, the past year is very significant and different than what we've seen before, says John C. Yang, president and executive director of the nonprofit Asian Americans Advancing Justice. The level of fear and hate that the Asian American community is facing right now is very real. The suspect in the Atlanta area shootings, Robert Aaron Long, 21, has been arrested and charged with eight counts of murder. Authorities say it's not clear uh, whether the shooting spree will, uh, will be designated a hate crime. Uh, Long himself told the police that the attacks were not motivated by racism. But many say the race of most, uh, excuse me, but many say the race of most of the victims can't be overlooked. Okay, one second here, I'm trying to get over to the... There we go. While we're relieved the, su uh, the suspect was quickly apprehended, we're certainly not at peace as this attack still points to an escalating threat uh, many in the Asian American community feel today, says Margaret Huang, president and chief executive of the Southern Poverty Law Center, a group that tracks hate crimes. Indeed, the Atlanta shootings were just the latest example of a surge in violence against Asian Americans. In January, an 84-year-old man from uh, from Thailand was slammed to the ground in San Francisco and died two days later from his injuries. In February, a Chinese man walking near Manhattan's Chinatown neighborhood was stabbed in the back. In many instances of Asian Americans being spat at and accused of spreading COVID-19 have been caught on video and posted on social media. Reports of hate crimes against people of Asian descent in the U.S. increased 150% in 2020, according to a report by the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at California State University in San Bernardino, which examined police records in 16 of the country's largest cities. Uh, that spike is all the more startling because overall, reports of hate crimes were down 7% nationally. A long history. The marginalization of Asian Americans has deep roots. The first significant wave of Asian immigrants to the U.S. were the Chinese, who began coming in the 1850s, largely to the West Coast to work in the Transcontinental Railroad and the gold mines, uh, and in the gold mines, excuse me. The history of hate and violence against Asians in America goes back almost as far. 
1871, at least 17 Chinese were lynched uh, by white and Hispanic rioters in Los Angeles after a white man was killed in the crossfire between rival Chinese groups. In 1882, the U.S. Uh, formalized, excuse me, the U.S. formalized anti-Chinese discrimination by passing the Chinese Exclusion Act, which banned immigrants from China. In 1900, an outbreak of bubonic plague in San Francisco was unfairly blamed on the Chinese community, and the Chinese, uh, the city's Chinatown was quarantined as a result. And most infamously, during World War II, tens of thousands of Japanese Americans were imprisoned in, and, excuse me, imprisoned in internment camps for years on the unfounded suspicion that they might threaten the U.S. war effort against Japan. Many Asian Americans, uh, excuse me, many Asian. Wow. Many Asian American community leaders say the current wave of bigotry was spurred in part by the rhetoric of public officials, including former President Donald Trump, who frequently referred to the coronavirus as the China virus. Demographics may also be, uh, be a contributing factor. According to Pew Research Center, the Asian American population increased by 72 percent uh, from 2000 to 2015, making it the fastest ethnic group in the U.S. That, uh, surpassing even the Latino popu uh, population's growth rate of 60%. Based on 2018 data, the Census Bureau estimates that there will be that there are 22.6 million people of Asian descent living in the US, representing nearly 7% of the country's total population, with the largest communities coming from China, India, and the Philippines. President Biden denounced the attacks against Asian Americans. He and Vice President Kamala Harris plan to meet in Atlanta on Friday with community leaders and state lawmakers from the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. Whatever the motivation here, Biden said, I know Asian Americans are very concerned because as you know, I have been speaking about the brutality against Asian Americans the last couple of months. And I think it's very, very troubling. The Atlanta shootings and other recent attacks have exposed how difficult it can be to prove racist motives, prove a racist racist motive and attacks against Asian Americans. As the debate over what legally qualifies as anti-Asian bias unfolds, the community is grappling with the reality that the law is simply not designed to account for many of the ways in which Asian Americans experience racism. For example, there is no widely recognized symbol of anti-Asian hate comparable to the noose or swastika, experts note. Historically, many Asian crime victims around the country have been small business owners who were robbed, complicating the question of motive. There's a recognizable prototype with anti-black or anti-Semitic or anti-gay hate crime, says Lu In Wang, a professor at the University of Pittsburgh. They're often more clear cut. In a coincidence of timing, the House of Representatives held a previously scheduled hearing on Thursday about the rise in anti-Asian uh, discrimination. Congressman Young Kim, a uh, California Republican who was one of six Asian American Congress, uh, congresswomen who spoke out in deeply personal testimony against the rising violence in a and increased bigotry. This should not have to be said, but I want to be very clear. No American of any race or ethnic group is responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic, Kim said. The virus does not discriminate. Michael Fu, a, the high school student from Atlanta, the Atlanta area, agrees that the pandemic has been a big part of the growing hostility toward a, uh, Asian Americans over the past year. I think the coronavirus has been weaponized in a sense to stigmatize Americans. Uh, Asian Americans and specifically Chinese Americans. He says the shootings this week were in some uh, uh, some ways the culmination of that, and the result is in is enormous anxiety among Asian Americans right now. He explains, no one should feel threatened when they step outside. Michael says the most important thing is everyone's safety, and that feeling of being safe is something that many of my Asian brothers and sisters feel is in jeopardy right now. But I also feel very hopeful about the amount of people speaking up and showing solidarity solidarity with the Asian community right now. All right, moving right along, folks. Uh, would you, could you open up your Unit 5 document right now, please? Okay, I want you to find... Let's all go right to week three right now, because we're all in week three. And even if you're not to the part in week three, I'm going to do some parts with you, and then you can go back and do the other stuff, okay? So we're going to do the, this part together. Oops, a little far. Okay. 
this part where it says notes 5.2 okay 5.2 okay so take a look at this just take a look at some of the questions that we're going to be answering okay Okay, one second. I'm going to mute myself so you guys can hear this really well. Legislative, executive, and judicial. Laws are written in the legislative branch, enacted in the executive branch, and interpreted by the judicial branch. But that's another video. Here's what makes the federal and Minnesota government similar. Both legislative branches are bicameral, bi meaning two, and camera meaning selfie stick accessory. Oh, camera is Latin for chamber. The chambers are called the House of Representatives and the Senate. Both executive branches have a chief executive, a cabinet, and many, many departments. Both judicial branches have a Supreme Court, a network of lower courts, and pretty flowing robes. Now, where do they differ? Legislatively, while the federal legislature is called the Congress, Minnesota State Legislature is not called Minnesota's Congress. It's called the Minnesota State Legislature. Executively, the United States has a president, while Minnesota has a governor. Under the president is a vice president, while in Minnesota there is a lieutenant governor, which is hard to spell, so everyone just writes LG. And while a president appoints their secretary of state and attorney general, in Minnesota those positions and a few others are elected offices. Judicially, there are nine judges on the Supreme Court, while there are only seven judges on Minnesota's Supreme Court. So instead of fielding a softball team, the Minnesota Supreme Court plays hockey in their spare time. Judges on the U.S. Supreme Court are appointed by the president to serve a lifetime term. Nice gig. Judges on the Minnesota Supreme Court are elected by the people to six-year terms. If there's a vacancy on the bench, a replacement will be appointed by the governor or the bench coach of the Minnesota Twins. We've only scratched the surface on how Minnesota's government is structured. To go deeper, watch our next lesson. So, are we unicameral or bicameral? Which one are we circling? What'd they say? How many houses? Bicameral. Okay, so go ahead and circle that one. Okay, next, right down here. We didn't talk about the specifics here, but I'm going to just give you these answers because I'm such a nice guy. So, I hope that everybody is looking at this right now because, uh, and if you are missing this presentation or you just aren't writing this down right now, uh, I attach this to the term, uh, Try 3 Google presentation right here. You guys know how to access this, right? Yes? So if this is kind of hard to read for you or those of you online uh, or whatever, I mean, if you just want to look the thing up on the Try 3 Google presentation, you have that ability to do that too. Um, but I'm just going to rock through this real quick here, okay? So um, the House of Representatives and the Senate. So like we said, we don't call this the Minnesota Congress. We call this the, what did he say? What do we call it? Do you guys know? The Minnesota Legislature, okay? That kind of takes care of both houses. That's kind of synonymous with Congress, okay? The Minnesota Legislature, okay? So the House of Representatives has got 134 members, okay? And now these requirements or these qualifications, I should say, are similar for both 21 years old, one year okay, as a resident of Minnesota, and then six months in the district you want to represent. Okay, Six months in the district you want to represent. Okay? So the differences in the size for both, um, just like the federal, okay, on the federal level, just like the House of Representatives is bigger than the Senate there, Okay, it's also bigger here. We've got 134 members here and you've got 67 members uh, in the Senate, okay? And just like, um, just like what we've got in the House of Representatives, okay, there are shorter terms here relative to the, uh, rel relative to the Senate. So when you go to the House of Representatives, you're gonna be in two-year terms. Now, the Senate is a little bit funky. It's a little different, it's a little weird in that, um, it's supposed to be four-year terms. However, 
if it's a year ending with zero, what do we do every time there's a year that ends with zero? What's special about that year? A year that ends in zero, what do we do? We hold a what? A census, very good. So if it's a census year, Okay, it, that will be a two-year term because they want to start anew there. So it goes 442, 442. Does that make sense, guys? Good. Okay, so it's four-year terms except in census years. Then we've got uh, then we've got two. Okay, so term limits for either none and none. Okay, ordinances. Have you guys ever heard of the phrase? Have you ever heard of an ordinance before? These happen on the micro level. So these happen on like the city or county level. Okay. Some cities like to hold special laws, okay, or special regulations for their community. For their community. Um, so for a short time, I lived in, uh, in Woodbury, Minnesota. And Woodbury, Minnesota had this ordinance, the city ordinance, that you were not allowed to put up like uh, signs on the street. So that included like garage sale signs or like, uh, let's say you were selling something in your home or like, you see all kinds of like weird little signs like this big on the, on the, on the side of the road, don't you? You know, like buy diet pills or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is they're selling. Well, there's a city ordinance in Woodbury, not allowed, can't do that. So my, uh, my buddy right after college, his job was to drive around and the city ordinance, you know, it was against their ordinance. So he went around and collected all those signs, threw them in the back of the car and just threw them in a the dumpster. That was his job for the most part because of that ordinance, okay? So that ordinance, okay, is kind of, it's on the local level, uh, local government uh, side of things, okay? Now you can make whatever ordinance you want, but it can't conflict with like a state, uh, with, a, uh, with a state or a federal law. You guys got me? Okay, so that's what an ordinance is. Okay, so who makes those ordinances on the level over here? Like who is responsible for those? Well, for the most part, it's going to be a collection of people in some capacity. So if it's a county government, they're gonna to bring together the county commissioners and they're going to be making that decision. Okay, if it's a city government, they'll make up what is called a city council. You guys have heard of that before, right? Okay. And then a board of commissioners or a board of trustees is who's going to be responsible for like a township. And then like you also could see like a, spe a special district. You are sitting in a special district. This is a school district. Got me? And who makes all the, the major decisions when it comes to this school board? Or excuse me, who? Strange. Um, who makes all of the uh, the decisions for this school district? Our school board. Does that make sense, guys? Okay, so that's why we've got a board there, okay? Next, and could anybody tell me, like, if you wanted, if you were really into, like, playing blackjack and you wanted to go to the casino, what are your options here in the United States? Where are you going to go? Where is it legal? You don't know? Are we really that bashful today? If you want to go to a casino, where do you go? Once once one is of age, where would you go? You go to Las Vegas in Atlantic City. Otherwise, do you see casinos otherwhere? Uh, or excuse me, otherwise? Where? What's that? Reservations, yes. Reservations. Now, the whole point of this is, and this is kind of a big thing for you guys to understand, is that those Indian reservations, those Native American reservations are supposed to operate like sovereign nations, meaning they have their own sovereignty on the same level, equal to that of the United States. Think of it kind of as a foreign country, because let's say that, um, for example, and those of you that are hunters know that this is a big deal, okay? You know, if you are uh, hunting on tribal land, you can get in some significant trouble. Got me? Because that is their jurisdiction. That is their responsibility. 
Okay, if you get in trouble on uh, on tribal land, okay, let's say that you, uh, I don't know, go decide that you're going to drive over to Mystic Lake and you're going to and you're going to rob the 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 convenience store that's over there. You wouldn't be prosecuted by like the Shakopee police. It would be the tribal council police there. You guys get me? Okay, because they've got sovereignty over that area. Okay, and then who makes up those rules or who who's who uh, who makes the laws? Okay, on that level, typically there is a tribal council that will be responsible for what's going on in that area. Now I know I, you know I'm trying to sell it to you like that. This is like you know uh, uh, its own independent country that you're going to, but it's that's kind of how it's supposed to operate. So there are a number of things, and hopefully you guys have gone over this in like uh, geography and uh, understanding that those are supposed to be little sovereign nations. So there's all kinds of different things that come up. Know what I mean? Like if you are a if you are a child in that in that area, you know you're supposed to be going to a you know they're responsible for the schools in that district, but who funds those schools? Know what I mean? Okay, all types of things that kind of come up because if you're a, if you're operating that land like a little sovereign area, you know um, there's all kinds of funding and taxes and like and regulations, all kinds of laws that come up because it can get really really sticky there. Okay. And we'll talk more about that as we as we go. Cool? Yeah? Any questions about this? None? Okay. So going back to this real quick. Are there any questions about how to complete the rest of the work for week three? What you're supposed so we did everything up until this point. Okay, you're gonna click on this and you're gonna figure out who is your speaker of the house, who's your majority leader, who's your minority leader. You're gonna click on this, and I know this says 2019 to 2020, but it's 2021 to 2022. You guys know that, right? Okay, sorry, I should I should have updated this, but you guys know that we're looking for stuff right now. Find those things, then find a current event that has to deal with the legislature. Okay, this could be. You can look on these sites. You can look on the all sides. You can look at the Star Tribune. You can look at the Pioneer Press. Okay, anything dealing with the legislative branch. It could be on the federal level. Could be on the state level. Could be on the county level. Could be I, I don't know whatever level you want. Okay, but find something dealing with the legislative branch and put it in there. Got me? And then just follow this explicitly. Okay, what did you learn about? Okay, and then answer the final reflection about what you gathered about what we just learned throughout the entire last three weeks. Good. When you're done with that, you will see that the, the little term quiz slash assessment is going to be open tomorrow. Take it any time Wednesday through Friday. Okay. Any questions, thoughts, feelings, or concerns, hopes, or fears? Anybody online have anything for the good of the order? Okay, so uh, I didn't mention this to, I didn't record this at the beginning because I, I forgot to record right away. But uh, those of you that are just showing up or you're just watching this video or whatever it might be, understand that that assessment's gonna be open later. It's gonna be 17 questions from stuff that we learned about multiple choice questions. And the rest of that, about 20 or so, will be terms of, of stuff from the Quizlet, okay? That will be open starting tomorrow. Take that anytime between Friday, or excuse me, between Wednesday and Friday, okay? And make sure that you submit this document before Friday. I'm going to be opening up just a plain old Dropbox that you can put that PDF into. Good? Is anybody using the Google Doc instead of the PDF? I think we cleared that up, right? Everybody's using the PDF? All right. Well, I will stick around. If anybody has any questions, those of you online, make it a great day or not. The choice is yours meaning you can log off and be done for the day.